Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. Let me tell you about something I did that I haven't really even said anything about to even my closest friends because it's just so out of character for me. But it was because of a gift certificate. Somebody gave me a gift certificate to one of these places where what you do is you go into a room by yourself. There's no light. There's no sound salt water, you float in the water for an hour and there is nothing going on. And this person told me, he said, you will really be surprised at how, at how this will change some things about you. And I have to tell you, it was 15 minutes of absolute torture because I was bored out of my mind and I kept thinking, wait a minute, why did I do this? I can always leave. I'm not being held captive here. And then I started thinking about Blaise Pascal saying that uh, one of the greatest difficulties is for someone to be able to sit in a room alone. Mm. And then I just started thinking about various things to keep myself occupied, like imagining what myself 15 years ago, trying to explain what has happened over the last 15 years to my younger self. And then that tipped its way over into praying. And I ended up with the most intense time of prayer that I have had in a long time, all because I was in a dark room yes. floating. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought about that experience a lot when I was reading the book that we're going to be talking about today called Reconnected, How Seven Screen-Free Weeks with Monks and Amish Farmers Helped Me Recover the Lost Art of Being Human with uh, one of my favorite Content, I hate the word content creators, but artists. Maybe that's the, the better word go, like to that. use. Carlos Whitaker, who most of you know, he's an author and a speaker and a storyteller. And uh, he speaks all over the place, hosts a podcast, authors lots of books. And this one has just come out and could not be at a uh, better time in the life of American culture. Uh, Carlos, thanks for being with us today. Russell, thank you for having me. I, I, I've I, not ever one d- done one of those little chamber things that you did, but I'm glad you did it so the rest of us don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually would like to do it again. I, I, I really would. Now, you, you wrote this book about kind of an Amish experience, a monkish existence, being yeah. away from screens. It, it's kind of like a book by Bobby Flay on fasting. <laughs> because you use technology in all kinds of ways to reach over 300,000 people via Instagram and then other platforms to what caused you to think, hey, yeah. maybe it's time to get away from some screens for a while. Yeah, it is. It is true. I love that. I've never thought about Bobby Flay writing a book on fasting, but it, it is <laughs> it, it is funny because we've become just so used to our our normality, right? Just what, you pick up your phone. I work on my phone. It's what I do. It's how I pay my bills. It's how I make a living. I talk to people via the camera on my device. And I'll tell you what 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 it was. What made me do it, Russell, was. I don't know how it works on an Android phone, but on if you have an iPhone, an iOS device, every single Sunday, you get a horrible notification that oh, slides yeah. across your screen. It's like a report says, card. It's like the report card, right? And it and and it just says how long you've been on your phone. Um, you've been on your you've averaged seven hours and whatever you know minutes a day this week. And you know what I normally do is I swipe it away and just ignore it. But one day I just decided, well, let me do a little bit of math. And this is, this is literally what made me write the book. I did the math and the math was, this is going to be poor math right here. We're, I'm a homeschool father, but I'm going to try to do it as good as I can here. <laughs> we, I, I was averaging seven plus hours a day on my phone, which 
equaled about 49 hours a week. And that was the first equation, answer to equation that made me kind of shudder. Like that's two entire cycles of the sun, right? Mm. Two entire 24 hour days where I'm looking at a screen. Then I kept doing the math. It was three months a year. Then I kept doing the math. If I lived to be in my 80s or 90s, I was going to spend 10 plus years staring at a phone. And I just thought, wow, wait a second. I think I can get a decade back of my life if I mm. change some things. And so I just, I emailed my agent and I said, hey, what, what, what do you think if I, if I would do this crazy experiment? Now, it started off as just two weeks. But when I added, I added a neuroscientist into the mix because I wanted to get my brain scanned before and after. He goes, nope, you're going to have to need, you know, be away from your phone more than that. So it ended up being seven weeks. And sure enough, you talk about the fir first 15 minutes of the deprivation chamber, whatever you were in. That was the first five days of my experience without a phone. What was, it was just torture. Um, and what and is then, that, how does that yeah. show up? I mean, like, what, like, what yeah. did you feel? Yeah, absolutely. So there I was, I spent the beginning of this experiment at a monastery uh, with 20 some odd Benedictine monks in 23 hours a day of silence. And how it showed up in me was legitimate body physical reactions to not consuming content from a screen. You know, the more I dive deep into it, the more I realized it's, it was a physical reaction my body was having to to lack of knowledge, to, to not knowing. And those reactions were, you know, they were manifesting in anxiety symptoms. It was um, heart palpitations. Literally, my heart was palpitating, skipping beats. It was waking up at 3 a.m., night sweats. Like I was soaking, mm. like I thought I was sick. Like night sweats, my body was coming off of the drug of knowledge. And it was, it was terrifying. It was horrible. I wanted to quit. I wanted to go home. You read about it in the book. I almost did. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I got past it. And my Dr. Amen, who uh, scanned my brain, said, Carlos, you legitimately were coming. You were detoxing from, from the phone. You were detoxing from the screens. And, and that, that is what happened to me. And it was horrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> did, you try to, did you try to sort of talk yourself through it by saying, well, the problem is I really need to know what's going on. I feel like oh. I'm out of the loop oh. and vulnerable uh, if I don't. Yes, know. yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, the amount of, of times that I said, you know, I think, and, and I think it may, may have been even two or threefold. It was, part of it was, yes, like I need to know what's going on. There was this desire. I, di I didn't know, you know, we're so used to knowing where our kids are at every moment. We've yeah. got tracking devices on their phone. We've got, you know, and I just don't know if we were created to know everything that we know. So I think that's the one thing. But the, the second part of it, to be honest you, with you and vulnerable, is like my identity, my job, who people see me as, is this caricature called Loswit on my Instagram and on my mm -hmm. Twitter. And suddenly there was a fear, there was a massive fear that when I left and when I left the space that people would just, you know, not even notice. And can I tell you something that's true? I was right. Like, well, I need to let everybody know if you were to just like disappear off the internet. I mean, some people may be like, oh, like where's Russell? Where, where's Carlos? But there's so many other people giving them things to think about that we cannot base our identity on these phones and what people think about us on there. And so a lot of it was that as well. I was coming off of the, the fear of my identity being rooted in my social media, all of the things that I, <laughs> I'm telling you, it was four or five days of like, I've made the worst decision of my life. This was, it was horrible for a few days. You know, sometimes when people think about a monastery and think about monks, they think about them as these otherworldly sort of characters who have stepped out of the 1500s and not realizing you know, monks are American, you know, those that are American monks are yep. American human beings who are coming out of the same context and taking vows and living a different sort of life. Did any of this, the other monks have kind of a similar experience when they first went into this way of life? You know, they, they did. There was a, a younger monk that was there. He's maybe 28. And let, let me tell you, when, when I met him, I remember, uh, Brother Thomas was his name. I remember looking at him thinking like, this, he's like a model. He's the be <laughs> one of the best looking guys I've ever seen. Definitely the best looking monk I've ever seen. Um, and he was super athletic. He was like working out all the time. So I, I got some time with him. And I said, hey, can I, can I just ask you why you're here? Like, what, what happened, you know? And come to find out he was a former professional skateboarder. So he's from Southern California. And he went to Biola University and, and got to travel up to 
St. Andrew's Abbey, which was the Abbey that I stayed at for like a, a school field trip in college. And he said he went there and he walked the grounds and he felt like the Lord told him, this is going to be your life. And Ooh. so he started to just go visit the monks up there. And he, he tells me that, especially being so young, that there is this pull for him because he's, he's coming into the monastic vows, you know, just in a different season culturally than any of the other monks that have been there for 40, 50 years. Uh, so he had to actually release technology as opposed to a lot of the other monks, the, these screens and things came to fruition while they were already there. It was great that I got to talk to Brother Thomas because he, he definitely feels the, the pull and the need to be on all the things. Now, here's something else people may not know. Monks are on Instagram. Monks, are, monks have phones. Monks, Father Carlos, who ended up being one of my best friends, not just because he has the same name as I do, but we're, we're communicating, we're DMing on Instagram all the time. He's like, you know, encouraging me here and there. And so that was a little shocking to me mm -hmm. to, to, to realize that, well, monks have phones too. And monks have to battle the same battles that we do. One of the deepest conversations I had was one of the monks telling me, I just feel like we're slowly losing our way because monks are, you know, they're, they're on their phones at the, uh, in the parking lot and there's guests that are coming to the monastery and they don't want to see a monk on a phone, yeah. you know? So they're having all these conversations within their monastic circles on what is this supposed to look like? So these screens aren't just a problem for us regular people here in America. It, it is chasing everybody. Was that a reassuring thought to think, you know, everybody's going through this? Or was that a scary thought to think, hey, you can't get away from this anywhere? Yeah. You know, uh, Russell, I, I was, what was scary to me was here I was. And if you think about it, what was really cool about the whole experience is since I didn't have a device on me, I never had a single notification remove my eyes from the person that I was speaking to for seven weeks, right? So seven weeks, I don't have anything buzz on my wrist or in my pocket. I'm fully focused. I'm fully in. And it was probably day nine. I, I remember I was sitting in Father Francis's office and I'm pouring my heart out to him and I'm telling him something about, you know, whatever. And I'm, I'm crying. And I'll never forget his phone on his desk goes bzz, bzz, in the middle of me, like spilling my thoughts to like the, the main monk, right? And he goes, oh, excuse me, young man. And he leans over and he picks up his phone and he swipes away. He goes, oh, I can answer that later. Anyway, continue. And I just remember going, did this monk just do exactly what, what I'm trying to get away from? So he starts laughing. He goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I need to read your book too. And so I think to answer your question, it didn't reassure me. It actually, it made, made me sad. You know, yeah. it, it made me sad to, to think that there, gosh, I mean, are there not any segments of society that are still free from the, the tethering to these things? And I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what, it, it could be the Amish or the monks, they are tethered in some way to, to screens like they have never been tethered before. And I got to see it firsthand. So how, how would um, the Amish be te tethered to screens? Yep. So, so the Amish, depending on the church, so there, there's different orders of Amish. There's new order, there's old order, there's low order, there's the Schwartz and Trubers, there's the Danners. So at, there's different, I, don't, I guess we could call it denominations mm -hmm. of Amish, right? And so their denomination has churches and the church elders vote on what technology can be used within their order. The largest order of Amish in America, they're called the old order, but they're, they're probably the most progressive order when it comes to technology. And so the old order can, if you have a business, you are allowed to have a flip phone. So Amish old order businesses, whether you're a farmer or you make, you know, they real the, the church elders realized that they could not survive as businesses without having some semblance of cellular signal. So they have flip phones. Mm. And what I learned is that the Amish, they're not like anti-technology. What they're trying to do is they're just trying to lessen the amount of technology. Technology could be a wheel, right? It could be a car, whatever it is. They're trying to keep it as primitive as possible in order to stay as close together as possible. So you know, um, mm. why they don't drive cars. It's not that they don't believe in cars or they think cars are evil. They just are like, well, if we all have cars and Miss Betty's barn burns down, we can't have her a new barn in two days because we're going to be gone. Mm. We've got to do whatever we can to protect our community. And I'll tell you what, Russell, that was something that actually began to 
burden me to where, where I'm like, maybe this is the way I'm going to make decisions about technology. Is this technology going to take me farther away from my community, farther away from my family, farther away from the people I love? It could be, you know, physically or it could be emotionally or spiritually, whatever it is. And I think that's something that the Amish do well. But here's, here's the sad part again. They are having to continue to progress away from what they used to be in order to maintain livelihood, in order to continue to farm and make money. They're having to have the conversation now. It's, well, should we allow tractors instead of just horses because our farms are closing down and in order to have them make money. So you see what I'm saying? So like, yeah. like there's progression. That, that there's progress- Amish AI is going to be something to behold, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> they actually have something called, they call it Amish Twitter. And so oh. they, they've got a, um, a paper that goes out every week around the country and it's, it's a newspaper and it has every kind of town, Amish town in the country. And it has like a paragraph about what's happening this week. This, this family had a baby and this is happening on this farm and our weather was like this. And so they read that every week to keep, keep up with what's happening around the country and they call it Amish Twitter. Wow. That is incredible. <laughs> that is inc- Now, you know, one of the things interesting to me about, about the Amish, unlike monks in a monastery yeah. where you're you're there and you're you're there unless something bad happens sure. with Amish some of them will have a room springer yep. where a young person can kind of go off into the big wide world and decide to come back and one at least one study that I saw said the overwhelming majority of them do come back and live mm-hmm. an Amish life yeah do you think it's because they they see that connection as being better I do. I, I do. I mean, I, I'll tell you what here. I am the most connected person I know out of all my friends to, and I would lay my head down every single night after working on that sheep farm. You know, I'm not a farm guy, right? Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't do that stuff. I was exhausted and I would go to bed every night thinking, how can I be more like this? Like this is, they, mm. they've got something figured out, you know? And so, yeah, I do know. I, I know a lot of them that, that have, um, um, gotten gone on the rump springer and then they've, they've come back. I know, I know a lot that, that have done that and, and gone. I know a lot, you know, I was, I was part of the family there, the Miller family to where mother Willis and, and Kathy are Amish. They're both two of the three kids have become Mennonite. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so Mennonite, you know, is just that they've, they're just less conservative than the Amish, right? but they kind of hold the same theology, and they, they all live one happy, you know, they're one happy family. One of the Mennonite daughter lives on the Amish farm and they love each other. And they're, you know, so one of the things also that was kind of destroyed in, in what I thought about Amish is that, you know, they they just shun each other and they're banning people. And that's just not what I, what I found to be true. They're, the, almost every Amish family that I interacted with had a lot of family members that were no longer Amish. They were either Mennonite and they were still every Sunday being together, you know, having, having meals. And so, yeah, it was, it it was beautiful, but definitely I think that the Amish will, I mean, I don't know, maybe you even have this. I've got more and more friends that I think are without knowing it, trying to become more Amish, you know, they're like, there's people going, finding homesteads. There are people trying to get back to the land. And I feel like there's a draw back to what God created us to be truly away from, away from these screens. Yeah. It seems that most people, when they think about Amish, they either have sort of a Moe's Schrute from the office picture, or, you know, one of the, one of the biggest selling genres for a long time has been Amish romance. Oh, they're all on my wife's bookshelf. Trust me. (laughs) So you have these sort of stereotype (laughs) views, but you, you in both of these places, it wasn't just that you were kind of reflecting, you were, you were working. Yeah. Yeah. And what did that show you about the the rhythm? And that's just very different from what you do normally every day. Yeah, no, normally I am, I am, I'm talking, looking at my phone, I'm editing videos, I'm talking to my phone. And, and so it it was, it was really two different, completely different experiences, right? So with, I think if it would have been flip-flopped and I would have gone with the Amish first instead of the monastery, I don't think I would have had the panic attacks that I had because the Amish go hard. These people... I mean, we're up before the sun rises. We're walking through the field. We're feeling the grass. We're making decisions about whether we're going to cut hay or we're going to you know, do whatever. We're with this. We go, 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 go. The monastery was silent. I was in mm. my head all day long. I, I there was man. There there was a lot of of inner wrestling that happened. And so so yeah. So when when I'm with the monks, it's prayer. You know, five times a day. 
It's, it's, it's walking around. I call it, one of my chapters is called Godspeed. I, I, I'm three miles an hour. That's how fast monks walk. That's how fast they taught me that Jesus walked. This was the pace of Jesus's ministry. Everything needs to be uh, purposeful, just slow. And so that was the, that was the, the monastery, right? The monastic life. When I got, it literally, it felt like I went from a cave to Manhattan when I got to Mount Hope, Ohio, four-way stop, stop sign, little town of Amish. They go hard. And I, I had a blast. I'm glad I ended with them because it, the community was just so so inviting to me. They were so loving, so accepting. You know, I was riding around on my little e-bike with my little Amish hat everywhere I went. And people were, you know, they wave at me on their little horse and buggies. And I met so many incredible people. So it was, it was night and day. But when I was working with the Amish, there's something about, one of the things that I learned about, really one of the things I don't use anymore that I realized I don't use anymore when I was with the Amish was intuition. Mm. We, we've kind of stopped using into, and the Amish use intuition all day long. I mean, and we just don't like, we, we don't, you know, know which way's north and south anymore. You know, like we've yeah. got our phones telling us what direction to go. I didn't have a phone. So when Willis would send me to the feed store to pick something up, I'd have to get on my e-bike and I would just have to remember how to get there and kind of trust my gut, you know, and th that's just something that we don't do anymore. I, I love, if you don't mind, I love to tell a story. It'll take 90 seconds oh, yeah, um, sure. about the, just the gut thing with, with Willis. So Willis was my farmer friend. He was teaching me how to sheep farm and we'd been waiting. This is probably day four or five and it'd been raining every day. And so we couldn't cut the hay because you got to wait till the hay dries, you know? So here I am from East LA, a black guy learning about how to cut hay and in Amishville. And he's like, every day, can't, can't cut the hay. So I wake up the fourth day. I look up, I, I hear thunder, you know, thunder and I see storm clouds. So I walk out there kind of feeling like, well, I'm, I'm a farmer now. So I tell Willis, Hey Willis, we're not going to, we're not going to cut hay today. Right. And he goes, well, actually, and he reaches down and he looks at my boots. He goes, there's dew on your boots. I go, okay, what, what do you, what does that mean? He goes, if there's dew on your boots, it's not going to rain. Hmm. And Russell, I remember being like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like, why? <laughs> what, what do you mean? He's like, my daddy always taught me if there's dew. So we're going to cut the hay. And I was like, we're going to ruin the hay, Willis. We've been waiting. We're going to ruin the hay. He's like, no, we're going to cut the hay. So I go off with Kathy and Diane, his daughter, and I go do something Amish. And it's pouring rain, buckets of rain on us. And we're a couple miles from the house. And I'm thinking, Willis made a mistake. And we, we go driving back to the house, riding back to the house. And we're about, I don't know, half a mile from their house. And I'm not kidding you. It was like a line of rain just ended. And we went through and it was completely dry. And this has mm. been hours. And we pulled in and Willis is just standing there with his arms crossed, smiling in front of me. And I got off and I'm shaking my head. head and he goes, there was dew on your boots. I told you. And I, and I just, mm. I think about that. And I just think we... We run to Google, we run to the weather app, all of these things that are wrong all the time. And we've forgotten what it is to trust our intuition, to trust our gut. And so that's something else that I learned while I was there is like, you know, God gave us a gut. He gave us our intuition for a reason. Uh, we just need to trust it more. Now you talk about in the book, eating. Yeah. What did you learn about these practices of, of eating in both yeah. of these spots? Good. So, so there, there's, there's a couple different things about eating that, that really were pretty mind-blowing to me and transformative. I'd say the first thing that I, I realized, it was, it was at the monastery, was, so we're eating in silence, right? So, so breakfast and dinner were in silence. And if you've ever eaten around a group of people, not by yourself, but around a group of people and nobody's talking, the, the sounds that you hear coming from your stomach, your throat, like, it's like, oh my gosh, like I make a lot of noise when I chew, <laughs> you know? And, and so, but what ended up happening was the flavors of the food that I was eating when I wasn't eating and checking my email or eating and looking at something else. Suddenly, all of my brain space, all of my sen senses were going straight to the chorizo con huevo that the cooks or that the monks had cooked that day. And suddenly everything tasted so much better. Mm. Why? Because we, I was focused on the delicious food and savoring. There's a whole chapter I have on savoring and what that looks like. You know, we don't, one of the things that I've changed too is I no longer, when I go to a coffee shop, I no longer get it to go. I always ask them, do you have a ceramic mug? Now, why mm. do I do that? Because I want to savor 
the coffee. I want to taste the coffee. I want to sit there. And I, I said, Carlos, do they act strange when you ask that? Or do yes, they do it? And, and here's what else I learned since then. At almost every Starbucks location you go to actually has ceramic mugs if you ask for them. So you can ask for a ceramic mug. And then I just thought to myself, if I don't have four minutes to just sit here, I, I, we were in Italy this summer with my family. We, we'd go to a gas station on the highway going down the road in the middle of nowhere. And nobody took their coffee to go at the gas station. They were sitting there drinking their little espressos out of tiny little strength, leaning against the counter at a gas station. And so I just think, you know, savoring is one of the things that I, we don't do anymore when we eat. We don't really savor our food. The second thing I would say, and this probably is more relevant to honestly where we at, are at as a society right now, you know, pre-election, all the things, we have lost the ability to not even ability, we, we've lost the time that we used to spend around the table. So, so when I was with the Amish, all of our meals, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, they would all last at least 45 minutes and dinners would last two to three hours. Mm. And the conversations that we had around the table were, I mean, believe it or not, me and the Amish don't agree on everything. Yeah. <laughs> so Willis and I were able to have some really incredible conversations about some really divisive topics that, you know, we're, we're, we're even politically speaking, we don't look, kind of look at the things the same. The fact that we had these conversations around the table, it was so safe. There's mm. something about the food and the time spent around the table. I can't remember. I, I need to pull this out. You're one of my first interviews that I'm doing about this book. So I don't have the exact data off the top of my head, but I do talk about it in the book where the average American meal time, like the average time that it takes for us to eat a meal, comparatively speaking, I think in the 1950s, it was over 30 to 40 minutes that we would sit around and have a meal. And now I want to say it's about 12 minutes. And so mm. if you think about that, now suddenly we're, we're not even sitting around tables anymore to practice conversation, to practice disagreeing on things. And man, that was for me with the Amish especially, Every night was filled with deep talks. A lot of them were uh, fun talks, but a lot of them were about where we are as a country. You know, um, how do we feel like we can move things? Why, why do the Amish do some things? And I'm like, well, I just don't, I'm not really hip to that. But it, there was such safety around the table. So those are really the two things about eating, savoring, and then, and then just community and the time spent around the table that we've lost. And I think because we've lost those things, I mean, we can, we can see it right now, right? I mean, we can see the rage ecosystem that we're living in because I don't think people are used to having longer conversations anymore. Was it awkward at all? Is it kind of like, okay, now we're going to discuss whatever, or is just the amount of time that you have, does that lead to kind of yeah. organic conversation? Yes. Yeah, I'd say it was a little bit of both, but mostly the organic kind of piece. You know, we'd sit down and we'd start talking about the day and, you know, I went to the horse auction and Willis was doing this and then, you know, about the lambs. And then he started talking about, well, gosh, you know, like I'm not selling as many lambs anymore because the price of lambs are, is going up. And gosh, I, j I just really wish that, you know, I wouldn't have to do this. And then, it, you know, things started getting a little bit more into the economy and then suddenly, you know, conversations. And then I was like, oh, well, yeah. And then we're, we're kind of so... Every night the conversation would go. But then there were some things that I was very specific, like, I want to know what the Amish believe about this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he, I mean, I knew I only had 14 days with them. So there were definitely some questions that I was asking very specifically, like, what do you think about this, Willis? Or what do you think about this? And I just was so grateful that, you know, you know, he not only did he let me ask those questions, but he let me record all of, all of the, oh. the questions he let me. So, I mean, I don't know if you even, you know this yet. I just announced it yesterday, but I've got a full length documentary coming out because I, I took a camera. Oh, I didn't me. know that. Yeah. So I, I took a, a Sony, a little Sony pocket camera that's not connected to the internet. I, I try to remind people that you can still buy cameras that aren't connected to your phone. And I, I recorded about 50 hours of conversations of thoughts while I was with the monks in the Amish. And Honestly, I recorded those things just so that I could have it so I could remember as I was writing my book. But after watching it all and going over it with my team, we were like, I think we may have a documentary. And so I gave it to a filmmaker. We've turned it into a documentary that's going to come out a month after the book comes out. So if you oh, pre-order the book right cool. now, you get a 10 minute sneak peek into the documentary. And I think that both of them together are going to fit really well together. And you'll be able to see Willis answer a lot of these questions that I was asking him. Oh, I like can't one of the wait for that. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the questions that I asked him is, 
Well, I thought that Amish didn't want their pictures taken because the first day I was there, I was like, hey, listen, I'm not, I have a camera like in my, where I'm staying, but I'll, maybe I'll record the sheep. I'm not going to record you. And he goes, well, why won't you record me? And I was like, well, because Amish, don't Amish believe that like your soul gets sent <laughs> to the devil when you, and he's like, Carlos, he's like, let, let me tell you something. Would you like somebody to go by your house and your, if your kid's in the front yard, pull out a camera and take a photo of them? And I was like, no. He goes, kind of the same thing with us. But since you know us, we trust you. So you could take our photo. So, you know, it's, Google Earth's of, doing it every day. <laughs> I know, you know, and so, <laughs> so anyway, so I've got a, uh, a 90, 90 minute documentary that is coming out in October. Wow. Based well, you know, that. one of the things is a challenge. I've noticed this and we have had a commitment to eat together as a family, uh, yeah. all of our, our lives, but there comes a certain point. We have three sons at home. Uh-huh. Um, two of them are working part-time jobs and two of them are taking college classes that, you know, will happen sometimes at night and everything. Yeah. And before you know it, you realize, wait, we've had, you know, mm. some assortment of everybody here, yeah. but not the whole group here. Yeah. And that's especially true when you're dealing with people who have like, you know, everyday sports practice and, totally. and that kind of thing. How does somebody kind of reclaim that time? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. You know, I mean, believe it or not, the, the Amish are the same way. Believe it or not, they, mm. they, they've they got the amount of addiction to softball that Amish have in volleyball. They, they are the most softball playing, volleyball playing people really? I've ever met. They are playing every day. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they are going. And so what I, what I, what I learned was that the meals are very important, right? But there was a, a spattering of different people that would show up to all the meals. But every single Sunday, with I'm telling you, it was like the most important thing that they do. Everybody comes together. So for them, it's one day a week where they know that they don't even have to ask. Like everybody knows this is the most important thing that's on my schedule this week. And so the, I, was, I was there for two Sundays. Well, I've been there many Sundays since because they've become like family. I go up there a lot. But I always go on Sundays. And why do I go on Sundays? Because I know that Every single, all the aunts, the cousins, everybody's going to be together in one location. And so that, that's, that's what I would say. I, I would just say, don't put pressure on yourself to, you know, don't put shame, sit in shame going like, well, my family can't do this. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Okay, that's okay. So, so why don't you find, you know, it doesn't even have to be a meal. Like, like what, what is, what is going to be the hour or two that you can just be together during the week? If it's every two weeks, then it has to be every two weeks. If you have to do it on Zoom or FaceTime because your family is scattered around the world, just do that. You know, there's, there's different games now that I see that people are playing on Zoom with their family uh, mm. and things like there's ways to be connected. So again, the, the screens aren't the problem. I, and, and I try to tell people that this book is not an anti-screen phone. I'm back on my phone. Like I, I, I do a lot of great things on my phone. Um, the, the book isn't about why the phones are bad. The book is about why what's on the other side of the phones are so good. And mm. when you start falling back in love with what's on the other side of your screen, then you just pick up your phone less and, and you get a lot of your life back. Now, I don't imagine there were any teenagers in the monastery, but that there were in the Amish communities. Yeah. And one of the things that we've talked about here with Jonathan Haidt and other people is about the, the mental health sort of strain, yeah. particularly for adolescents and young adults as a result of connectedness, social media screens and so forth. Yeah. Did you discern anything about kind of what's it, what's it like to be a teenager in some of these communities right yeah. now? Yeah, no, I, I, I did. And again, I, this is going to lean, you're right, obviously more into the Amish community. But the, you know, knowing that I think what scares me a little bit is seeing technology, screen technology begin to sneak into Amish culture, right? So you can have mm. flip phones now. Um, you can have, you know, whatever it is. A lot of the Amish work on computers, right? They're, they're, they, they work on computers during the day for their work and then they come home and they're disconnected. And so, you know, I, I look at the, I look at the, you know, I do look at the teenagers that I met and yes, they're, they're just playing together, even, even into their 17th year, like they're, you know, out in the field, they're running around on the four wheelers, they're, they're doing fun things outside. There was a lot more of that. And I also do believe, and this is something that the Amish are very passionate about, that the mental health crisis hasn't hit them like it's hit the rest of society uh, with their teenagers. You, you can even look at like just suicide statistics and things like that. It just, it just hasn't touched the Amish community like it has the rest of us. And it doesn't take moving to an Amish community to know 
what the poison that that these things can be, right? Like yeah. I tell parents all the time, if I could do it over again, and we were some of the last parents in our kids' friend groups to allow them to have phones. So we were like, oh, look at us. Like we're the last ones. If I could do it again, I would wait as long as, as possible before I give my kid a screen. I just, I just would. And so, yeah, you know, so, you know, I, again, there, I didn't have a lot of conversations with teens. This was more just kind of looking and seeing them and kind of what they did every single day. Um, but yeah, they're, they're around the table. They're, they're some of the most, Timmy, who is the youngest son of Willis and Kathy. I think he may have been 18. I'm telling you, such a conversationalist, such a reader. He, he was, you know, brilliant. He, he was talking about Henry Nouwen and all of these books that, he's, that he'd read. And I'm like, gosh, like I, I'm still not to the level of he is when it comes to philosophy and all these things because he's reading. I mean, they love to read. And so for some of them, you know, he actually told me that he was addicted to books. And, and I was like, oh, okay. He's like, yeah, well, th- this is my problem. I think I read too much. I need to spend more time with my family. But yeah, I, I think, I think, I think I need and- to find his support group. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like he and I need to be together. <laughs> Amazing. You know, one of the things I chuckled at in your book, because I thought I was the only one. <laughs> I love people when think- someone starts it off like that. <laughs> yeah. People think I'm crazy when I say, if I really need to relax and just yeah. sort of... Put me down in the middle of Manhattan and yes. let me walk. And one, one of the things I figured out about that, it's because there's enough. I don't know where I'm going. So there's enough that kind of surprises you about, uh-huh. oh, look at that uh, uh-huh. coffee shop or look at those those people coming through. But you can just walk and walk yeah. and walk. And, yeah. and you talk about that in this book and also about fly fishing and and other things that kind of get you out of the yeah. out of the screen yeah. world. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, though, that you recommend that I thought, whoa, is commuting in silence. I think that would be hard. Yeah. Well, because we we we've lost solitude. Like it's gone. Where where there is some studies that I researched for the book that showed that we're the first of all the generations to literally not have the ability anymore to have solitude. Solitude used to be a part of everybody's journey. And I can't remember what year it was that they, that they normalized radios in cars, <clears throat> but it was up until that point where every single car ride or buggy ride or whatever it was, was just in silence. And so, yeah, I do. I recommend that. I, I do it all the time now. I don't listen to podcasts. I don't, I still listen to podcasts, but I, I don't, do it on all my drives anymore. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, if I'm on a long road trip, I may take an hour and it's actually amazing. Before you do it, ask God, God, show me something. Take, take my mind in the direction that you would have it go. And you'll be amazed at maybe some of the ideas that have been hiding in the corner of your soul that you haven't even had the capacity to be able to hear that suddenly when you're not consuming something, boom, it pops up, your life gets changed because you had this idea because you weren't consuming something. So I definitely recommend that. And, and you know, I, I just think that solitude is vital. Uh, it's so important for us and we, and we have lost it. And so we have to purposely bring it back. My, my wife is vindicated in one way by your book because <laughs> I have been making fun of her for years because whenever she talks about GPS and, yes. putting, you know, I've got my direction, she'll always say, well, I map quested it. <laughs> and I'll say, oh, your so Gen good. X self coming out. Map, map quest hasn't existed in forever. Yes. I said, you're kind of like the, you know, our grandparents saying the ice box or something like that. Yeah. We're talking about the refrigerator. But you talk about it in the book that you you really recommend that people print out their, dec- their yes. uh, directions and not use the GPS. Why is that? Well, I'm, I'm going to read you a little paragraph from the book. A 2006 study. Now, this is 2006. Okay, we're, we're way past that. Scanning the brains of London taxi drivers found that the hippocampi, the region responsible for direction in the brain, increased in volume and developed neurodense gray matter when they were using GPS. Individuals mm. who frequently navigate complex environments the old-fashioned way by identifying landmarks literally grew their brains. And additionally, many studies showed that Alzheimer's and dementia decreased in cab drivers that this study looked at. And so I started thinking, so my dad has dementia Mm -hmm. and I'm constant, I'm very big on brain health, all of these things. So I think initially I, before the thing, I was like, well, what can I do to 
keep my brain from going that direction. One of the things that it said was to get lost, get lost and find your way more often. And, you know, Russell, that is actually something that we don't do anymore. People do right. not get lost. We don't even have the ability to get lost anymore because Siri is telling us where to turn left, where to turn right. When I was with the Amish, when I was at the, at the monastery, I was stuck, right? I was just in the, on, on the monastery. With the Amish, I, was, I had my e-bike, the horse and buggy every once in a while, and I was able to go different places. And I got lost every single time. <laughs> Not only did I get lost, I mean, I was, it should have taken 15 minutes, it'd take three hours. But the amount of people that I met when I was asking directions, the amount of, you know, it actually was so fun to get lost and, and find my way that when I got back, it, it is true, ask my family, you know, DM them right now if you're listening. They are so annoyed because if we're just going to church, my family, which will will put it in maps. And I'm like, we go to church every, three times a week. We know exact. But dad, what if there's traffic? Well, what if there's traffic? Right. You know, they want to get there the fastest way possible. Then let's sit in some traffic. And so, yeah, you're right. I no longer put addresses in my maps. If anyone's with me, just let you know if I'm driving we're going to find our way and I will map quest it. Okay. It's not, I call it map quest too, because map quest <laughs> used to be a verb. Yeah. Just like, just like we use Google as a verb as your wife uses it. Oh, uh, let's map quest it. And yeah, well, I'll she write is going down. to feel so oh, triumphant seen. after yes, this. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. I hope she feels seen because her and I are changing the way people drive. <laughs> <laughs> now we went to a new restaurant uh, a couple nights ago. Uh -huh. First thing I do, I notice is I, I pull up Yelp. Yes. And I want to see, you know, yes. if somebody's gotten food poisoning yes. or something like that. And you say in the book, I need to stop doing that. Yes. Why? Because why in the world are we adding in? I guess because I was the same way. Why am I adding information into my brain instead of exploring and maybe screwing up, maybe ordering something that you don't like? And then having that experience, we're literally lessening our human experience and we're not trusting our gut, like uh, what I want to do more often is go to a restaurant and without yelping it, because I, I, it's the exact same thing. I would like, what's the most popular thing that people eat? No, I want to look for, I want to look at something. The, the experience of looking at something on a menu, reading the ingredients, reading what's in it, thinking in your mind, oh my gosh, that, that sounds really good. And then getting it and it being even better than you thought. And it's not something that anybody on Yelp would have ever recommended. I'm telling you, that makes the experience way better than if you just go on Yelp and find the stars and find the what you know. My wife, she hates it when I Yelp because she's like, Yelp is always wrong. Like it is, it is yeah, always. That's true. Why are we trusting somebody else's taste buds? We have our own taste buds, you know. And so, yeah, uh, yeah. Again, I I just think that's more information than than we need. Being able to live for seven weeks and not know anything other than what was happening directly in my community around me. Like I, I had, I did not have the ability to know what was happening around planet earth. I, I just think. And you eventually just let go the, of the need yeah, of that. Yes, to stop I, worrying I, about I did. And, and guess what? I let go of the need of knowing what's happening around the world because the needs that were happening in the tiny little circle that were around me, I realized this may be the capacity that we have. Like maybe God created us with the capacity to just care for those that are directly around us. Now, I'm not saying that we can't pray for and we can't know what's happening around the world. I think there's, there's obvious benefits to that. But I did realize that there is way more happening within one city block of us that we could literally devote our entire lives to. And I think maybe we're missing that. We're missing what's happening locally because we're just looking so far away all the time. So, you know, just cut the amount of information that is coming in. And I promise that doesn't mean that you're going to be dumber. That doesn't mean that you're going to be less than. It may mean that you're going to have the capacity suddenly to care about things that maybe you should care about that you've forgotten to. I uh, follow your Instagram feed all yeah. the time. And one of the, I mean, I hate to say storylines because it's your real life, but sure storyline of a life that's really been moving to me was your dad, who you mentioned has, is having some, some dementia issues, yeah. moving him in next door to you. What have yeah. you learned in that experience? Gosh, uh, you know, I just turned 50 and w when you're 30 and you're married, like you're just, you're just thinking about you when you're thinking about, you know, your little family and kind of, and I think what I've learned is, you know, there's a season of life that nobody talks about. And this is the one, this is why I talk about it so often on my Instagram. It's the season where you're still taking care of your kids. 
Mm-hmm. But then you're suddenly taking care of your parents too. And I find myself like with barely any capacity for anything else, but I feel Russell so on assignment. I feel so purposeful. I feel, you know, I, I, I have realized through watching my parents and being so close to them that we, we have discarded the very fabric, I think, in, in America on what family is supposed to possibly look like. And I, I'm not shaming anybody that mm-hmm. has had to put their parents in a home. Sure, I know that yeah. we've got jobs, we've got things we got to do. But to what level can we make sure that we are inconveniencing ourselves in order to provide support and love for our family? I, I look at the Amish. All the Amish they build, they're on the farm. Most of them live on the property that their parents farmed, right? Mm-hmm. And then their parents are not too old to farm. So they build them a little house 20 feet from their door and they're just taking care of the elderly. And I, I just don't think that we take care of, of the, this giant generation of incredible men and women that have gone before us. And so I'm trying to honor my dad. I'm trying to love on him and I'm trying to show my kids, hey, listen, I'm going to be 87 years old one day <laughs> And I would love for you to remember how it is that we took care of my mom and my dad. And so, man, I'm learning so much. I'm learning a lot about, you know, just dementia in and of itself. I'm a big part of this book, I got my brain scanned before and after. I'm learning about what are things that maybe my dad did that maybe led towards some of this and how can I course correct that in my life? I'm learning how incredible my mother is as a caregiver. You know, she's in her 70s and she's the primary caregiver for my dad and just what wedding vows actually mean Mm -hmm. for better or worse. Like, what does that look like? She, the other day, she's like, I just, you know, my my dad, so we just put him on hospice and my mom's just like, I'm just going to miss taking care of him. Mm. And I was like, oh, I mean, like, like all of these beautiful things. So I feel so honored and blessed to, to witness, to witness this love story across the street from me uh, with my mom and my dad while, you know, it's so cool because my daughter just got married. So I, I get to witness this love story that's in the beginning stages mm. over here and watching that. And I'm also watching my parents in their season of their journey. Gosh, I, I just, I'm literally on cloud nine, even though it's hard and it's very difficult. I'm loving the journey and sharing about the journey, you know, as you said on Instagram, because a lot of people are so, feel so alone. They feel yeah, like they're they the do. only ones, the amount of people that are like, Carlos, thank you for talking about this. We're going through this with my grandpa or my dad. I, I just I want people to not feel so alone in it. You know, the other thing I think that is really moving to me about that is that there is a certain sense of maybe the kind of self-presentation that we've talked about before, where you think, oh, I, I wouldn't want someone to see me mm. if I'm not in my, mm. you know, uh, in yeah. my prime or whatever. And yet, your dad is such a a strong figure yeah even in that weakness yeah and i think that does people a lot of good to to see that i mean i think if for instance you have one where you're showing him his preaching which yeah. he doesn't he doesn't remember and yeah. kind of walking him through that and i thought you know i hope i kept thinking oh. i hope yeah. That I would be like him. Yes. In that situation. Yes. One day. It really is revelatory of a. Mm, thank you. Of a person of, of integrity. Mm. I mean, I think seeing that is, is really moving. Well, it's, it's moving and he still has life to give. He still yeah. has life to live in. You know, I try to tell people all the time, if somebody is at the end stage of dementia and they're still alive, then they still have purpose. And my dad's purpose now is literally shifting the perspective of thousands of people on what it looks like to love well until the end. And I want to just make sure that my dad continues to serve a purpose, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and to show him what his purpose used to be and what his purpose, you know, continues to be now. One thing we do on this show, Carlos, is yeah. at the end, we have a desert island bookshelf that we do in the newsletter oh. Oh. Uh, every week. But what we do here is to ask you, you're going to be on a desert island Ooh. for the rest of your life. Oh, gosh. You are not sure that you're going to be able to have your memory for long. Okay. So you choose right now five books of the Bible. Oh. And those are the only books you're going to have oh. for the rest of your life. What five wow. do you choose? Okay. I'm going to need, I'm going to need the Psalms because I, I, I need to know that somebody else is having the mental crisis that, that I'm having as well. I need David to pull me off there. I'm probably going to go with Luke 
If I'm going to have to choose one of the gospels, I don't know. Luke just does it for me every single time. I just feel mm-hmm. like I can relate to what he's doing. Hebrews, I'm going to, I'm going to need me some Hebrews. I'm just going to need some, some focused attention on uh, what it looks like to live it out that way. And then, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm like a Netflix guy and I need, I'm going to need revelation, like give me, give me something like, you know, crazy and apocalyptic to look forward to. And then let me say, Let's go with Gen. Just start with the beginning too. Give me some Genesis too. Like, give me some of that. So there, there's the five that I got for you. All right, <laughs> Carlos Whitaker. The book is called Reconnected: How Seven Screen-Free Weeks with Monks and Amish Farmers Helped Me Recover the Lost Art of Being Human. This was fun. Thanks for being here. It was Carlos. so fun. Thanks, Russell. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host is Russell Moore. Producer, Will Dawson. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Mackenzie Hill. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering provided by Dan Phelps. Video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. 